What's going on engineers? In this video, we're gonna look at how to get started with continuous integration. Essentially what continuous integration is, it's the process by which when developers commit new code to a shared branch, it pushes out that code to a build server. And on that build server, it's gonna run a number of things, typically automated tests, code analysis, and then of course doing the actual build of your product. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I already do that. I built my product, I test my product. What, what is continuous integration? And the biggest difference of course, is that this way is gonna be automated. And at the end, the big goal of continuous integration is to catch problems with new features early and then catch regressions caused by those new features early before they get to production. So for the how to get started part, we're gonna cover four things in total. We're gonna to talk about deciding if you actually need it, selecting a tool, configuring what should run in continuous integration, and then actually integrating it into your workflow. So let's just jump in and do that. So when I think about deciding if I need to use continuous integration, there's three primary things I think about. The first is that how many people are gonna work on the project? Second is how big is the project? And then the third is how much time do I waste doing things that could just be automated? Now, if you're a solo developer who's working on a project, maybe you're only gonna work on it a couple of weeks and that's really it. Nobody's ever gonna work on it with you and there's not really a complicated build step, then it might be more effort to set up a continuous integration thing than it is to just do it manually. But if you're a group of developers working on the same code base and one developer over here writing a feature may affect another developer over here writing another feature, then those are gonna be the folks who are gonna benefit the most by continuous integration. Because when both people push their features onto the shared branch and continuous integration automated tests run, then you're gonna find out right there if there's a problem. As far as selecting a tool goes, it comes down to what features do you need and how much do you want to pay? Now with continuous integration tools, there are actually a million of them. There's so many. So there's not gonna be any shortage of tools for you to choose from, and they're all gonna differ just based on feature set and cost. For all of our examples, we'll be using Travis CI just because the project that I authored several years back, Travis CI was the continuous integration product that I picked because at the time it was free for open source projects, and I think it still is. Worth mentioning that I'm not being paid by Travis CI, it just happens to be the product that I used a while back. Now that we've decided that we do need continuous integration and that we've selected a tool, in this case, Travis CI, it's now time to configure exactly what should run. So to figure out that, we have to first look at the project. So this is a project I wrote a while back. It's called Dispenser D. It's a Golang message queuing system that I wrote purpose-built about five years ago for an unrelated project. Now, what the project does is not necessarily important. However, this was an open source project that I did develop that I did expect that people may contribute to and help me build. Additionally, because of the nature of the system being a message queue, it's important that the software absolutely does not fail. Otherwise, it's gonna cause chaos in people's projects. So because of those two facts alone, I knew I needed continuous integration and I knew I needed automated tests. Now, how to actually write tests, that's outside the scope of this video, but know that I have a folder called tests and in that folder, I have a file called test.py and in that Python file, I have a bunch of tests that are running against a running instance of Dispenser D. Just so you can quickly see how the tests work, once I'm in the folder, I have a script called run tests. And then when I run that, it will start dispenser D and run several tests and it'll let me know. It ran 16 tests and everything's okay. You could see that each test ended with an okay. So now that I have my project, I have my tests. Really my goal here is to make it so every time a commit occurs onto this particular project, I want to automatically run those tests. And the way this works is every time a commit occurs onto this repository, it triggers a webhook. And if we go to webhooks here in GitHub, we can see that there is a webhook sending to notify.travisci.org. Once Travis CI receives notification that a new commit has occurred, the first thing it's gonna do is spin up a virtual machine and then it's gonna actually clone the current version of the repository to that virtual machine. In the case of Travis CI, once it clones that repository to the virtual machine, it's gonna look for this file called .travis.yml. And it's this file that's gonna be used to actually describe exactly how the continuous integration should work. Now, while this configuration is specific to Travis CI and the configuration for another product is probably gonna be different, the concepts of how this work are gonna be mostly the same. And in this case, the things the continuous integration system needs to know about is first, what language do you wanna test against? Which versions of that language do you want to test against? What are the prerequisites that you should install prior to doing the testing? And then what's the actual script that you should run to run those tests? So first I'm saying the language is Go, and then I want to test against 1.6, 1.7, 1 1.8. Keep in mind this product is old. At the time, 1.8 was the newest version of Go. Of course, at the time of this video's recording, you know, it's much newer, but that was the highest version at the time. 
for the prerequisites, because my test file uses Python requests to make HTTP calls, I need to use pip to install requests. And finally, the script that should run when the continuous integration system starts up is going to be run tests. And if we look at that file, we can see that it has several things in it. Don't worry too much if you don't understand exactly what you're reading here. There's really only three lines in this file that matter. The first is that Python 3 runs my test file. And then I store the resulting exit code in a variable called test status. And I do that because on line 26, I then need to basically exit the script with that specific status. And the reason I have to do this is because Travis CI is going to look at that exit code and that's how it's gonna determine whether or not the test actually passed or failed. Keep in mind that most continuous integration systems are language agnostic and they don't have any concept of say Python tests. They deal in exit codes. So if the exit code is zero, it's seen as a pass. If the exit code is non-zero, then it's seen as a failure. So now we have our webhook all set and we have our test ready and we have our configuration file done. Let's go look at what it looks like on the Travis CI side. On the dashboard for this project, it's gonna show the most recent build. And this is what you can see here. And this is one that was done about three hours ago. The other thing it'll show you is the entire history of every build it's ever done and then its result. So green, of course, is it passed and then red, of course, is that it failed. But not only will the build show you the actual result of the test, it'll actually show you exactly what it ran. So if we click one of these here, we'll see a bunch of terminal output. So what we're actually seeing here is the result of our test. And then at the bottom, you can see the command run test exited with zero. Now you may have noticed that the output here is the exact same as the output that was in our terminal earlier when we ran them manually. And that's because it's running the exact same script in pretty much the exact same environment. You know, but it's doing it automated now. Just for contrast, I want to show you what a failed test would look like. So in this case, if you remember how all of them used to be okay, you could see that the first five were okay, and then the last two were failures. And then it actually states here exactly why the failure was. False is not equal true, and then you look at the test and you can see exactly why that was. And then at the bottom here, you can see where it says the command run test exited with one. So because it was non-zero, Travis CI treated that as a failure. So the final result here is that we have our project, we have a test suite, and then we have an automated system that makes it so anytime there's a commit to this project, it automatically runs those tests against those changes to make sure everything still works. Better even, if people are making pull requests for your project, you can actually have it so when they open a PR, it automatically starts a job at Travis CI, which pulls down their proposed changes that they want to merge in, make sure all the tests pass, and then it will report that right in the pull request. That way you as the maintainer can say, hey, wait a minute, your changes breaks everything. You need to go fix that. And could you have just done that manually? Yeah, sure, absolutely. But as code velocity increases and you expect a number of commits and PRs, it makes sense to do it in an automated way. So just kind of a recap on what we did. We had an existing project with some existing tests. And what we did is we selected a continuous integration tool, in this case, Travis CI. We used their configuration, which we place into our repo. We add a webhook, which notified Travis CI when we make a new commit or a new branch opens or a pull request is created. Travis CI then clones the repo, looks at the config, does the automated build, runs the tests, and then reports whether or not those tests pass or failed. And hopefully by doing so, I've increased the quality of the code and I've made certain that there's not gonna be any bugs in production. And that's really all there is to continuous integration at a basic level. Of course, we've only just looked at the tip of the iceberg and the full iceberg of continuous integration goes really, really deep. And here in 2020, getting started with continuous integration is pretty easy, especially if you're on GitHub, since GitHub integrates with a lot of different things and a lot of different things integrate with GitHub. And that's really it. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, please leave them below in the comments. Other than that, hope to see everybody on the next video. Take care.